Praise the Lord God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Word. You know, all Master's Word programs are Christian internet radio and TV talk shows directed at educating, edifying, and helping the body of Christ to gain understanding of God's Word and to know just who they are in Christ Jesus. I'm Dr. Stephanie. I'm your host. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, just overflowing through our lips. We praise you and we love you. We thank you, Lord, that as we seek you and your kingdom, you always illuminate your word so we gain proper understanding of it. We thank you for the rhema word of God, for revelation, knowledge, and manifestation of your word, alive and active in our hearts and lives. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as we endeavor to know you more intimately and love you more deeply. Holy Spirit, we invite you to take over the broadcast right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now, did you come expecting to receive? If you don't expect to receive from God, then you won't. So get that expectation level elevated, my friends. Know that you will come away from each meeting, each broadcast, each Bible study with more head and heart knowledge. So, my brothers and sisters, expect to receive. Amen. Now, God in our spirit, soul, and body is what we're going to be talking about today. You know, we can build the best house. We can, we can build the best building, all right? But there is nothing like God's presence. One minute in the presence of God is better than a million years here on this earth. He visits us when we invite him. I invited him this morning, and he's still here in his spirit. <laughs> he came a while ago just to pay me a visit in person. Now, I will conclude this series on wisdom. That's what we're talking about. Um, in the mind of Christ, or wisdom in the mind of Christ, with this particular lesson. And I want to give you some tips that you'll want to use throughout your life. We're going to conclude the series by looking at the total man. Man as spirit, soul, and body. And especially since we're looking at the mind of man and how it relates to us. See, God all, has always made man right from the beginning when he created Adam a spirit, a soul, and a body. Man has a body, and we're going to call a house uh, uh, in which the spirit and the soul of man lives. That's what we're going to call it. And in order for us to have a, a fruitful, good life that God wants for us to have, all right, we must understand the harmonious flow of the spirit, soul, and body. Whatever happens in the spirit realm will affect the natural realm. And some of the things that happen in your physical life and in your physical body will have a subtle influence on your soul in your makeup. We need to be aware of it and to understand it. Now, God made us um, in this life with seasons. Our body has its seasonal changes. There is childhood that cycles into adulthood. There are monthly cycles in a woman's body. Um, there are a uh, daily cycle of being awake and sleeping. There is the cycle of time to eat and time to rest. We need to understand it in order to flow in the cycles in the spirit world, in the soul realm, and in the physical world. Man's physical body will affect the mind to a certain extent. Some of the things in the natural do have an influence on the soul, but they won't affect our spirit if you don't allow it. However, it does have an effect on the mind. The spirit is the greatest influence, but what we want to see particularly is the mind, the soul of man. All right, now we're going to see a little bit of the body in relation to the mind, but we will basically be looking at the mind, the soul of man. Uh, man's body consists of five senses, the senses, sense of sight, touch, taste, and smell, and hearing. All these five senses make up the physical world that we have contact with. Our spirit consists of three primary areas, intuition, communion, and conscience. The soul of man consists of three primary parts, the mind, the emotion, and the will. Each has its own mechanism and manifestation. With your mind, your intellect, you think. All right. With your emotion, you feel. With your will, you choose. The mind has thoughts. It handles thoughts just like your stomach handles food. Thoughts are tangible substances in the invisible realm. A thought is a seed of life, just as a word is a seed of a force. Every thought that comes to us has potential life in it. It's either the life of God or the life of the enemy. Every word we speak has power. It's a force. It, it puts what we say in force, in action. Thoughts contain life just as words contain power whether it's power for evil or power for good. With words, you can destroy. 
Words are like bottles, invisible bottles that contain power, and some people fill it with hate and it multiplies. Words are powerful forces, my friends, and these are invisible weapons. Thoughts are life forms in the spirit world. When you receive a thought from God, it's full of life. And as the life germinates in you, it grows and matures. A thought has a maturing process. You have to understand these things in terms of seeds. A seed has potential life inside of it, waiting to be planted in order to release that life. Now, if you go to a market, you'll notice that they sell different types of seeds. Red beans, green peas, soybeans, etc. Now, you can take them and plant them, and they'll grow. When you have a thought from God, from the Holy Spirit, remember Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and be with you and in you. He is in us right now. As born-again believers, the Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit's going to be a farmer in your life. He's not going to do the work for you. He's going to work with you. He's not going to work for you, and neither will you work for Him. But it's us working with Him. It's neither God doing it for us, nor we doing it for God. God doesn't want you to work for Him, because you'll end up in the flesh using your own strength. Remember, the mind doesn't know what to do. It's also doing it His way. Knowing what to do is one part. Knowing how to do it is another. And then doing it with his ability is another thing altogether. It's interesting, though, that he wants us to do it with him. He lends us a hand, and we lend him our hand, and together we do it. So, the Holy Spirit is in our life, and he's like a farmer. He's going to do things together with us in an intricate way. He plants energy seed and life into us. The Holy, Spirit's pla the Holy Spirit places thoughts. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has come and will bring to remembrance the things that I spoke to you. Jesus said that to his disciples in John 14. Um, he said that to his disciples. Now, as he gives you a thought, that thought is a seed. It's a seed of life. And a seed has um, a maturing process. You can't harvest anything from that seed. You'll need the seed of his thought to consume you, to grow in you, to mature before it comes out. And that's a thought. All right? When that seed is released through your words, it's a different process. It goes to step two. Words carry power, and Jesus says his words carry life. Now, the words we speak are designed to release a force and a power into the invisible realm and into people's lives and into our circumstances. So it's releasing the power of command through the name of Jesus. Things, atoms, molecules, life, and everything will obey your word. Not necessarily immediately, my friends. Of course, I'm talking about everything that's in line with God's words, not our own words. Not words in the natural. See, the devil's words. But as long as your life is right with God and you're willing in a per I'm not willing, you're living. And you're living in a perfect will of God and is doing his will, and you're doing his will, your words contain power. Your words have a command in them, and as you issue that command forth, there will be forces that will release the circumstances in order for them to flow together, to create the manifestation. Now, it may not be immediately, but there are times that the manifestation will be immediate. Yet it could be a week, a month, you know. But as you put these principles into practice, you're going to find that your words contain power. Every atom, every molecule of this whole universe is subject to the power of the spoken word. Did you know that? And that same spoken word is potentially within you, waiting to depart your lips. So our mind handles the seed or thoughts. Our emotions handle the seed of experience. Experience in terms of feeling, sensation. See, you, you can read through a theological book consisting of ten volumes entitled The Love of God, and you study them with a dictionary and all of the intricate theological definitions and attributes of love, but after ten years of study, you will never experience the sensation of love. Not like you will when you're in God's presence and His love consumes you. You feel like butter melting in the sun. There's no experience like that. The experience of being loved makes us feel like a little child in His presence. That one experience is worth at least three years of theological training. Because something is placed within you and then you feel it. People with experiences in different things make them different in the natural and in the spiritual. If you know everything about healing, but you've never prayed for anyone, well then, it's different. The day starts when you start praying for someone for healing. <laughs> okay, and that's when you're going to see it. Now, after a month or a year of that, when, it speak, when I speak to you again, there's something different about you. Or even in the natural, you can learn a skill. There's something different in experiencing it. Or even in counseling. You see, because, let's go back to the, the doing something with your hands, a skill. If you can learn about it in a book, 
and then when you go to put your hands on it, then you you experience the doing of it, the the actual watching it come together and forming of it, and the manifestation taking place because of the works of your hands. So it makes your, your experience completely different than you just read about it in a book. Now, um, uh, let me take, for example, maybe this will help you too. Uh, I was a, a hairdresser in a, a previous time, not in a previous life, <laughs> but early on in my career, uh, I was a hairdresser. I started out, but I got allergic to the stuff that I was working with and had to quit and do something else. Anyway, but when I went to school for it, I'd started out with classes on, on uh, uh, anatomy classes. You know, I mean, we, we had a theory, and, and that we had theory every morning. That was book learning. We went in and we read about it, and we taught, were taught it for, in the classroom experience, all right? Once we did that, we had theory as, as beginning students for quite a long time before we were allowed to step out on the floor and start our experience end of it, our practical application. And so then we had theory and practical application. And we began doing hair on the floor, cutting hair, dyeing it, bleaching it, doing all kinds of things, giving perms. Okay, so it was when we got our hands on it that it all came together for us. And we actually started shampooing the hair and moving it and doing the, the manipulations that we were taught in the classroom from the book. And then when, once we got the experience under us and we had the book learning and the experience you know what we did? We took a, a state board examination and we either passed or failed. And if we passed it, we went on to be a professional hairdresser where we could do the work on people and get paid for it. Otherwise, we had to go back to class and start over again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so even in counseling, the first time you're dealing with people, the way you do it, people will be able to tell if you're ex inexperienced or not. After many years of practice, you are experienced. What's that substance? That's the seed of experience. Like emotion, experience is a part and parcel of our life. The emotion has the seed of sensation and feeling, uh, communication beyond words. So we must be schooled in all areas, not only just in words. You know, when someone's down, crying, or weeping, there's nothing like a good hug. A hug goes beyond words. It's the experience of being hugged, touched. They have tested children who are never touched or cuddled, and those who were cuddled only for a brief amount of time. And they found that they grow up differently. They became highly tensed like uh, uh, high strung as we call it. Little children, when someone's highly strung, he is like a violin string. When you put tension on a violin string and you press on that string and continue applying that pressure, the sound or octave goes higher. Now notice when people are highly tensed or, or they're high strung, the sound of their voice becomes kind of higher in, in pitch, in octave, in, in volume. That's relative to two things. Don't judge people with high voices. <laughs> But let me express this in a way that you can gain understanding and so that God can change your life in that area too. In my study of people for, for this lesson, I noted that the highly tensed people have very squeaky kind of voices. Their voices are higher in pitch. It's going to be relative to two things. Now don't jump to a conclusion yet. You see, the more highly tensed you are, the higher your voice. The more relaxed your, a person is, the lower your voice will be in pitch and tone. That, of course, is relative to two things. Number one, a person's natural voice, and number two, organic or physical problems that will cause their voice to be higher in tone. Okay, now in judging the individual alone, if your voice is normal, when you get excited, you always go higher. But you could tell the tension level of a person by the voice level. Husbands and wives, you should know each other so well that when you hear your husband's or wife's voice, you know their, their tension level. So you know how to react to them. All right? If you sense the tension level to be higher, pray. Don't talk too much. Not yet, anyway. Do you know that being a husband or a wife is an art? <laughs> you have to learn how to flow with one another. You sit with a person and you can know how tense a person is by the way they speak. Even little babies, as they grow up, need to be touched. Some of us were brought up in homes where there were you were never kissed and you were never touched, never cuddled by your parents. And I want you to notice those who come from homes where they've been touched, hugged, and cuddled are more secure. You know, they, they, they feel secure in everything. There's nothing like a touch to communicate. Now, we also need to balance intellectual development with emotional development. And you're going to be surprised that a lot of people develop intellect, but they don't ever develop their emotions. There's no school in which to train their emotions, but emotions can be trained through the school of hard knocks. Now, because some people get knocked down on too hard, their emotions aren't trained to flow with the Spirit of God. Emotions are not tuned to God. 
Why are we touching on this area? Why am I even bringing it up? Because of this reason. Satan can send the fiery darts of bad thoughts, opposed to God's good thoughts. Satan can mess with your emotions and cause you to assume a bad feeling which is opposed to God's good feelings. Satan's attack on your life is not just on the mind. It's on your total soul. Now, sometimes you feel lousy emotionally. You know, that's a fiery dart of emotion from the devil. So be aware that he can throw darts at your emotions all the time so that your emotions are not trained and will be, well, just like an untrained mind. An untrained mind can't differentiate between God's thoughts and the devil's thoughts and our own thoughts. An untrained emotional, uh, I, I mean, an untrained emotion, I'm sorry, uh, can't differentiate between a God experience given to you and an invitation from the devil and human emotions. They can't tell the difference. The Holy Spirit is here, but it's more a spiritual, glorious kind of presence that permeates the air. However, my point is that when, when he personally comes, you feel it. There's nothing like meeting the Lord personally. It changes your life. How to describe it? How to impart it? Only by experience. It's the training of our emotions. Why are we teaching on this area? Why am I to even bringing it up? Because of the second reason. In our private lives, many of us are not yielding our emotions to God. Your worship of God is highly intellectual. Get up in the morning, pray in tongues, read your Bible, do everything but forget one thing. Here's the clue. If you really want to move by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit moves in all three areas, spirit, soul, and will. I will talk about the will later on. It's like, it in, it, it's like in this natural life, you have five senses and three of the senses are not working. Part of your physical world is cut off from you. If you can't hear, you won't know music. If you can't see, you can't see colors. For you, it's, it's like a whole world is missing. Your accuracy to tell a direction. If I were to say, uh, could you just come with me and let's take a walk and go to the 7-Eleven down the road a piece? If you have five senses, it'll take you just a few minutes to walk there. But if you don't have the sense of sight and the sense of hearing, well, you try it. In the same way, our soul is the experience portion that we have before the spirit. In other words, the spirit imparts it to the soul so that we can experience God with our soul. The Bible talks about the renewal of the soul. It implies one of the shades of meaning in the Greek is the training of the soul. So our emotions can be trained in God. And if you really want to be led by the Spirit and learn when He comes in, see, when Jesus comes, I know when He comes. When the Holy Spirit speaks, I know His voice. I know exactly what He tells me to do. How do we have to have the... Uh, how do we have to have the other part? Why, I should say, do we have to have the other part? Uh, uh, how do we get that? By having our emotions developed. Um, uh, it, it, look at it this way. In your private life, when you pray and worship God, allow your emotions to worship God. You know, like I've said, every thought that actually that actually consumes you, um, you need to be consumed by every thought, okay? <laughs> a thought as a maturing process. Um, I'm having just a second. Thank you, Lord. All right. I, I was getting something from the Lord, and I couldn't talk at the same time. Okay, a thought has a maturing process, and when a thought is mature, you'll feel that thought. Like if you say you love someone, at perhaps the first per, first perhaps you don't have it come to to know that person well enough to say that you heard all the bad things about that person, and you look at the person outwardly, you don't find that you can really love that person with God's love, but then you begin to relate with that person and you begin to grow to love that person. Now after many years you can love that person. You can say like what Paul says, I'm thankful for your fellowship, your partnership, thankful for your partnership and, and thankful for the love that we share in Jesus. He remembered those things and he thanked God, right? Um, now, uh, he, he remembered them with feeling. That's my point. He remembered them with feeling. That's when the thoughts have matured. It has entered into your emotional stage, all right? And whenever you're not moved by what you read in the Bible, your emotion has gone astray. Only your mind is left. If you can ever read the Bible or meditate on Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus coming to love you without shedding a tear, your emotion is dead and you're backslidden. 
you haven't even sinned yet, but you're backslidden, and you'll be vulnerable to the devil's attack because the Holy Spirit is not in possession of your emotion. Now, when the devil uh, will make sure, th then the devil will make sure he, he gets that part, uh, and through there, he'll dominate your, your life and destroy it. I mean, that's how he works. So how do we keep our love for God alive? By contemplation and meditation. Whenever my emotions can't worship God, what do I do? Like David, I say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and I will worship the Lord. I will worship God. Worship is important. Expressing your singing to God is important. And and uh, you really worship Him. Every time I worship God, I, I get choked up and weep. If a day ever comes that I can't cry, then I'm no, no longer touched. My heart's too hard, and God can't use me. If you can't weep before God, if those words to those hymns that you're singing don't touch you, you emotionally, if you can, can talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, coming to love us without emotion, uh, I mean, uh, without being moved, you have backslidden in your soul. Now, I want to show you what kind of man Paul was. What kind of a man after God's heart will be like? All right. Here are some of the things he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Now, 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote, so he's at his peak, and although he must have been in the ministry for nearly half a century, he never lost his first love for God. His emotion was still in control by the Holy Spirit. And he says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Now, isn't that a strange statement? Somebody writes to you a letter and says, I remember your tears. Every time I remember your tears, I'm filled with joy. <laughs> Come on. If you read it wrongly, it looks very cruel. It's like when you cry, I laugh. That's not what he means. But is an inner joy from the Spirit, not an outward giggling, and laughter. Why? Because Paul appreciates tears. The Bible says they who sow in tears will reap in joy. Now there are two kinds of tears. There is sorrow from the world that leads to death and there is the sorrow that is from God that leads to repentance. And we have to live in repented, uh, live in a repented life all the time, maintaining that, um, uh, that repented position in God. A broken and a contrite spirit he will not cast aside. God himself declares in heaven uh, that heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool, where shall I find a place to dwell? In the book of Isaiah, right towards the ending, he says, in a broken and contrite heart. We need to touch God uh, and, and to have God touch us in those areas in our lives. And you'll hear about that in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, when he talks about family. Be ye tender-hearted. The Greek word tender-hearted means easily moved to tears. Now, I know that's directly opposed to what the world's way is, but let me ask you this question. You have never seen Mr. Devil cry, have you? He has no heart in that area. He has lost it completely. That's why those who follow after him are likened unto him. The Bible says that this world, uh, those who do not live in, uh, li in this world, those who do not know him live in darkness, and the spirit of this world dominates their lives. See, it's hard. It's hard in a harsh world out there, and we are trained to withhold our emotions. But God's word says, nope, 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 don't do that. Why? Because in the world when you cry, you're considered weak. In the world when you're, when you're meek, you're soft. That's why the world interprets it that way. It's opposed to the Bible's way. The meek shall inherit the earth, my friends. Outside, it says you do it. So don't let the world's thinking affect you. In the world, tears equal weakness. Tenderheartedness equal being a jellyfish, but not with God. The strongest man in the Bible cried. In Hebrews 5, the Bible says Jesus prayed and cried to God with tears. Because the only thoughts and prayers and words that really move us are those that reach down deep enough to touch our emotions. That's when it really has an effect on your life. Too many people are pushing things off their emotions. Don't allow God to touch their emotions. No wonder their lives are not changed. Change can only come when you allow God to live in your whole soul. That's our emotions. Emotions handle experience. Okay? Um... Our, our will handles choice, but our will handles the seed of desire as well. Desire doesn't lie in your emotions, nor does it lie in your intellect. People who do not know it, but desire, uh, they don't know it. You know, I mean, I, people, most people don't know this. Um, 
desires are the seeds of your will. All right? And you need to understand that. People don't know it. The desires of the, uh, are the, se the seeds of your will. Your will, not somebody else's will. <laughs> so um, keep that in mind. Now, uh, you never struggle to do what you desire because the, your will is lined up to do it. Here's my example. When your will is lined up to do something, the desire is there, right? I want to do that, so you go do it. There's a desire to do it. And when the desire is there, your will lines up to follow it. Now, just as the thoughts are for the mind and the feelings are for the emotion, right? Desire relates to your will. Now, we must nurture the seed of desire. Sometimes you have certain desires from God coming up. God drops desires in, into your seeds of desire. So the word comes into your life in three areas to touch your soul. It's thoughts, spiritual experiences, and spiritual desires. Now, if you'll follow those desires, your will and your uh, 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 will turn and follow it. So, my friend, it's not a question of having a strong will. It's a question of having a strong desire. A lot of people try to change their life by strong will. Every new year, they make a resolution and break it in February. It's not willpower that will help you live a Christian life. If you're thinking of living a Christian life for God and by yourself, you, <laughs> you're trying to do it, you might as well forget it because you're never going to be able to do it. No matter, uh, no matter what, no man, no woman alive can live a Christian life and the Christ-like life without Christ inside of us. The secret is not to look at Christianity as a credo and a religion to follow. You must understand it. It's the person and the spirit who live in us. And then we learn how to flow with him who lives in us. We flow with his thoughts. We flow with the experience that he wants to bring us. And and our tears are coming out in our in our uh, prayer time. And they just we just let go. Let it go. Let him control you. And then he puts desires in your heart. And we learn to flow with him. You see, it's we and him working together, just like God can put thoughts in our mind, experiences in our emotions, desires in our will. The devil also tries. Okay? Now, once in a while, you'll get a sudden desire to do something not from God. It's a dart from the enemy. Recognize it. He that believeth shall not make haste. God is not pushy. He's never pushy. Although the Bible does say, and suddenly the wind of God came. But remember, uh, all suddenlies are preceded by a waiting period. If there is no waiting, then there's not going to be a suddenly. <laughs> there are two types of suddenly, just as there are two types of thoughts. And suddenly I had a desire to do this, and I did it. You found that it was wrong. A lot of people do wrong things suddenly in a moment of foolishness. In a moment of fleshy desire, they do it. Then they regret it later. Just a, just a moment. We have to understand most of the time Christians are fighting a battle, but they are fighting one-third of the battle because they didn't know the other two-thirds. They are only having their shield to ward off all the wrong thoughts. That's all they've got, their shield of faith. But we forget these other two areas. There's a fight on for your soul. There's a fight on for your mind. There's a fight on for your emotions. And the devil will try to grab your emotions through the sorrow of the world opposing the sorrow that comes from God. When a crisis happens, when something bad happens, notice the emotions going through you. The darts of emotion. You begin to have a feeling of hatred against God. Feeling of rejection that comes from the devil against people. Feelings of anger. Where did all these feelings come from? Well, now some of it is our flesh, but they are fed from the darts that come from the enemy. It's not the evil spirit, but they are the darts of false desire, false emotion. And if you don't watch it, that spirit of rejection can also make you cry, but you're crying for the different reason. When you cry, there is more fear in your life and your emotions are captured. You're having a pity party. Every time, even 10 years later, you'll still, you, you still can cry. You know why? Because your emotions are not cleansed yet. It's still um, feel, uh, feeling, it's still feeling the, the darts of the enemy inside bleeding away. Now, we have to train the mind as well as the emotions so that they feel the right things, not wrong things. There are certain things we uh, get to harden our emotions, and there are certain things we go to close the thoughts to. We get so close to them that we, have to, we, need, to, we need to close those thoughts off. All right, Satan tries to put certain thoughts in your mind, and you say, no, no way, I'm not going to think those thoughts. But there are certain times when you're in worship like this, and you're touched with the tears that want to flow out, and you push it back. What did you do? You resisted it. I'm not going to cry. What will my wife think? What will my husband think? What will my other friends think? What will my pastor think? Nobody's going to think anything. The fact is, um, if the, the pastor will uh, 
was asked, he'd say, go ahead and cry. You see, when God moves you, let go of your emotions. Why hold back emotions? Sometimes when I go for my walk, uh, at little walks around the house or whatever, or whatever I'm doing, or if I go out and sit in my gazebo, I feel my emotions rising towards God and I just let it go. Tears will run down my face when I think about the goodness of God. Why? Because I want God to train my emotions to flow with Him so that when the time comes, when the Spirit moves, I'll know and I can feel Him because I have trained my emotions to flow with Him. See, we need to watch for the enemy's darts and the wrong desires and the wrong emotion. Wrong desires having to do with the will. All right. Sometimes we have a good desire from God, a desire to do something right. And you know it's good. Then you say, I will put this off. I don't want to, I don't have time for this right now. I don't have time for that and to do that. So you allow the desire to come out from you. In other words, you brush it off. And as a result, your desires are not trained to flow with God. I always train my desires, my friends. I learned it the hard way. I always train my desires. Sometimes I have an inclination. Could, could be the slightest thing, a desire to help somebody. And I'll check it out first with God. I pray and I sense it and it's good and it confirms my spirit. I flow with that and I will do something about it. So I put action to it. So I train my desires. I allow my thoughts to come and as I do, I take them captive and submit them, put them under submission to Christ. If they don't line up with God's will, and then, the, then I'm not going to think them. I'm not going to put any action to them. Now after sometimes my desires are so strong that my will is easily bent to God. When God tells me something, I, I get the desire to do the thing of God, and I do it with all my heart. It's not the power of the will, it's the power of the desire that we develop. It can grow, and it can be nurtured in our lives. So we're not talking about willpower, we're talking about desire, training desire. So learn to yield and flow with, with that. Do the right things, even small, tiny things. God doesn't train us with big things. Sometimes doing small things for people. Sometimes the Holy Spirit reminds us small things, uh, of small things. You just have an inclination. And when God leads you, it's through your mind, through your emotions, and through your desires. It all flows together. We have a spiritual soul that is a tricycle. Some of us have lost two wheels, and it's a drag in life. Put your wheels back on. Train it in God so that you can flow with God's Spirit, His desires. Now, there are certain things we can do to train ourselves, especially in our soul and then in our mind. And I conclude by touching on something about training and the usage of the subconscious mind. Um, the subconscious mind is, uh, it, well, it came about after the fall of Adam. I, I just need to explain it to you. There was a veil and all the scriptures were inside. Ephesians 4 says there was a veil that blocks the Gentiles from knowing God because their minds are darkened because of their alienation from the life of God, which was what happened in Genesis 3 when Adam fell. His mind was cut off, a part of his mind. So we have what is now called the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Before the fall, Adam's whole mind was conscious, but now there was a, there's a veil. All right. The Bible talks about the veil, and now we have... Um, we haven't gotten our entire mind back with God, but there are certain secrets that you can have and put into use and you can train your mind with. So let me share some of them. According to the Bible, the dhyana, which is the soul area of our mind, which is the subconscious area of your mind that sees into the spirit world, it's the area of visualizing. There's two Greek words for the word mind that we have studied, the word dialogismos and dhyana. Now, here is an important fact that has been tested. I have a little book on quantum theory, okay? It's fitness, quantum fitness. Talks about physical realm and the scientists um, that, that worked on it. This, they did a study, research uh, study years ago, and they thought that it was impossible to control involuntary action when they, when they started out this theory thing. There are certain actions that are involuntary, like our heart beating, our lungs breathing. You know, we breathe, we don't even think about it which is a reflex action. He said it has been recently discovered that we can control involuntary action, but through different processes, through visualization, a different process, through visualization. Now he was interviewing this magician, and this magician had trained himself where he stopped his heartbeat for a while, 
And this person's analysis is that the person uses a process of visualizing. Visualization. All right. So, number one, what's the context between the subconscious and the conscious mind? The visual area. Through your subconscious mind, vision is the most important thing. If you can see it, then you can begin to harness the, uh, the uh, power that's inherent in your subconscious. But the power of the subconscious is tapped through vision. Now, we understand why our subconscious mind is in that state. It was because, generally speaking, the vision and the vis visualiz visualization ability of people is very low. You see, the average person can hardly visualize. Like if you come, uh, say, on a bus one day, and uh, let me ask you how many people were there on the bus. Most of the time, you wouldn't realize it. Your subconscious recorded it, but you can't recall it. There's no connection to recall it. It's just like the other day. I was calling on one of these people for servicing the uh, printing machine. I, I had called him in and told him to come out. And he was asking which salesman came to my house when I was on the phone. And I said, I don't remember him. Tell me his name. And I tried to describe him, you know. <laughs> um, and I suddenly realized that I didn't remember much about him. Even though he has been with me for about 20 minutes in time uh, in my house, working on this computer, this uh, copy machine. So imagine that there are a lot of things that pass us by that we can't recall. So in the same way, there's a connection that is through the dhyana, that's the link into the subconscious realm, and you can use it in God. Now, some people are afraid of all these because they don't realize that there are a lot of natural discoveries uh, today, that, and then their principles are already in the Bible, except that it's being abused. So, because it is abused, um, doesn't mean now that we put it into disuse. No. Like confession, some people outside understand, but for us, we came in from, from God's particular point. The subconscious mind is there all the time, whether you want to use it or not. So, if you don't know how to, how to flow with what God has made of us, we cannot reach the total maximum manhood or womanhood that God wants us to have, which is the fullness of your spirit, soul, and body to do God's will and use it to the maximum that God wants. I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time. I guess I'm long-winded today. Um, I just want to say, remember that um, wisdom is the principal thing. Proverbs 4, 7 tells us. A wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Above all, keep Jesus Lord of your life. The Master's touch is a or word is a, he, is a subsidiary of the he, Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. You know, we're a 501c3 organization. Now, because you are in Christ... Get this in your mind and in your heart. Because you're in Christ, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. I have to go. I'll see you next time. God bless you.